Scusi, non parlo italiano, so I better continue in English. I think then it's better for you and us. And uh, thank you also that you're still with us, as we already know over extra time, so we will certainly keep it short. What I would like to share with you is two examples how the private sector can contribute to community development in order to create value and alleviate poverty. Um, the one is Yaborandi, around a plant, a medicinal plant, which is used to treat glaucoma because it has the pilocapine. Um, and normally, the collectors in Brazil were not really getting their share in terms of money. Now, what can be done in order to alleviate poverty and then also create economic growth? But at the same time, you would like to make sure that the natural reserves are protected. The answer was a public-private partnership between Bering Ingelheim, German Technical Corporation, and Central Flora, which is a biodiversity agency in Brazil. It was initiated in 2011. And um, what is the beauty about that? Let me focus on the collectors, because this is what we talk about, creating value and saving wealth in the community, or creating it. The collectors, formerly deprived, now were identified, registered, trained, and authorized to harvest the plant. And the outcome was that they could multiply the income. So the brokers got less, and they got much more. This leading to the fact that they could now afford to buy health and education likewise, and thereby contributing to the well-being of the community they live in. And you can imagine that a lot of others would also like to join, and that was the reason why the program had been extended, and they have, been, they have awarded a price, the Brazilian government, as a shining example of sustainable development in a rural setting. Now let me come to the, what I would call the, the flagship we are very proud of, together with Ashoka, uh, making more health. And that is around supporting social entrepreneurs and the idea of social innovation. And as has been mentioned, this is a global initiative, but I would like to focus a bit on what we do in emerging markets and developing countries. Now, the initiative is, as I say, global. That means that employees around the world are asked to join in. This is a voluntary undertaking. So those of us being employees with Bering Ingelheim who like the idea are then able to assist social entrepreneurs. What that is, Sarah will mention in a minute what a social entrepreneur is, somebody with an innovative idea which can change the community to the better. And we have also some of us as so-called executives in residence. Now, what that means is quite simple. You will not be at your workplace for a couple of months, but you rather are attached to one of these social entrepreneurs to assist him or her in her endeavor, in his or her endeavor. Practically, not with money, but practically with your skills, experience, your network, and capacity. And you can imagine when these Executives in residence come back to the company, they have to tell us a lot. So they are, in a way, ambassadors for the entire program, which, by and large, is already starting to change the mindset of all of us, which is an exciting experience. So we think a bit out of the box, not just as pharmaceutical company, but what can be done in addition. And what is fascinating to see is also the part of the youth program. As you know, young people are so creative, so we have now more than 100 youth initiatives all over the world, and these people, the young people, when they become adults, they still have in mind, we have done something in the past, so let us continue to contribute to the betterment of our communities. And just to give you one example, we now plan to team up in an unconventional partnership, I would call it, because for a pharmaceutical company, it's not conventional to work with somebody who has invented an, an aid for hearing impaired people. It's called Solar Ear. 
so it is based on renewable energy. It's an affordable tool to um, assist these people with their hearing impairments. And India alone has 80 million people with hearing impairments, and out of those 12 million are children. So what we think about is to identify entrepreneurs who can come to the rescue of those handicapped people. They shall identify them and then assist in the intervention with that. And I would like to end here and hand over to Sarah because she can tell you a bit more about what these entrepreneurs are all about. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. It's a great honor to be here today. I've been truly inspired by all the innovations in the new scientific research that I've learned about. And I, I really believe I'm, I'm much more confident in, in, in um, the future of health. And I wanted to take some, some moments today to talk about the role of social innovation in social entrepreneurs in this changing future, as I feel that their work is ex ex extremely relevant to, to all of us. A social entrepreneur is, is an individual like me and you who has a very uh, a creative new, new idea to, to, to change a, a, a pressing social issue. And this social entrepreneur has a relentless determination to make that new idea a reality and to spread that new idea so it becomes the new practice within society. Now, I work for an organization called Ashoka and um, we've been supporting social entrepreneurs now for over 30 years with the conviction that this is the most leveraged investment that we can make. And today we have around 3,000 social entrepreneurs across 70 countries um, in our network. And with Boringer Ingelheim, we're supporting, around six, we're supporting around 600 of these social entrepreneurs who are working specifically in health. And um, together, we're able to dig more deeply into health innovations and to start to identify some of the common design principles that help these social entrepreneurs become more impactful. And so I wanted to share some of those with you. The first of these is place patients at the center of care. This is a social entrepreneur named Mohammed Ayubadi, and he is um, enabling patients to upload and to manage and to share their, their personal medical records with their family, with their doctors, and um, with, with researchers if, if they decide to do so. His online platform called Patients Know Best has become integrated in, into the UK's national health system. Mohammed's insight is that if you, if you put patients in control of their health, if you make them more active participants in their care, that that in turn will reduce the infrastructure and the transactional costs of the greater system. This has huge implications for cost savings across, across our, our health systems. The next design principle is design for efficiency. This is a social entrepreneur in Mexico named Javier Lozano. He's created a, a one-stop shop for diabetes care. This means that anyone with diabetes can, can come to his clinic and under one roof and one visit can access a huge um, uh, uh, continuum of care. So they can access diagnostics, treatment, information on nutrition, physical education. Uh, they can even buy their prescriptions at, at his clinics. Javier turns a system which can be very scary and hard to navigate into one that is actually quite, quite simple um, and efficient. The patients that go to Javier's clinics, they, um, their the patient complications are, are reduced by 60% and patient adherence is, is increased by, by 70%. Another design principle is redefine traditional roles. This is uh, Frank Kaufman from Germany, and the, the, the woman sitting next to him, is, she's blind. And she is a certified clinical breast examiner. And because of, of the acute sense of her touch, her and many other blind women are getting trained in, in um, detecting breast lumps. And these women can detect lumps that are 50% 50, 50 um, detect 50% more breast lumps, which are 30% smaller in size than, um, 
than uh, traditional de detection methods. And so people like Frank Hoffman and other social entrepreneurs are telling us that we need to look beyond traditional doctors, beyond traditional healthcare professionals, to others that can provide quality care. And finally, create uncommon connections. Sharon Terry in the United States, um, she's working, she's, she's creating an entire new way to, to uh, conduct research for, for rare genetic diseases. Um, she's bringing together different stakeholders that never work together, like the industry, consumers, policymakers, scientists, and she's incentivizing them with, with tools, with uh, pooled, pooled resources, with, with a biobank to share DNA samples, with very innovative uh, digital tools. And she's, she's surrounding them around a common vision to accelerate cure and treatment around rare diseases. Sharon Terry is telling us that if you step outside of your field, outside of your sector, you will be much more impactful in your work. So these social entrepreneurs are really defining a, a new future, a, a new vision for, for healthcare. This is one where um, we have a much greater focus on the patient, where we value prevention and well-being, where we integrate um, services and holistic solutions, and where we work beyond our silos, and, and we partner. Uh, Ashoka and Baring Ingelheim are, are really proud to be supporting these fellows. We, we, we believe that, that they're really the answer to, to a new vision of healthcare. Um, I want to ask you all today to, to think about your work and to think about how, how you're contributing to a healthier society. And if you're using some of these design principles, great, recognize that and reinforce them and focus on them more. If you're not using them, then maybe start to begin to think about how you might be able to integrate them, because you will have much more impact. And although we may not all be social entrepreneurs, we, we can all create change, and we all can create a society where we, with, with approved health comes and with much more access to health. Thank you. <laughs>